Welcome, everybody. Great to see so many people on this evening. Um, I'm really excited about this evening. Um, been looking forward to, to this particular tasting for quite some time. And I know that a lot of people have been waiting in anticipation as we've got a good solid core of South Africans amongst our influencer group. My name is Phil. Um, I'll be the host this evening for you, those of you who are new to Sipping Rooms. Um, those of you, of you who are new to Sipping Rooms, what is it all about? Well, Sipping Rooms was developed as a um, way of communicating um, brand stories directly into your living room. Um, came up with this in the middle of lockdown and it has continued all the way through. Um, and it's been, I think this is our ninth uh, sipping rooms, if, I'm, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and yeah, we absolutely love finding out about the stories of distilleries, directly from the people who came up with the brands and um, put in the hard yards to start things up. So this evening, we are really, really privileged to be able to hear the story of Inverosh uh, straight from Lorna Scott, who founded the company, um, who is will be talking to us directly from South Africa. Not only that, we're going to have... Um, one of uh, the brand ambassadors introducing the brand to us as well and taking us through the actual uh, flavor of the amber, which if, um, if you bought the amber, you'll know exactly what it looks like. Hopefully you've poured yourself one already, but we'll, we'll go through that again um, with Bo, the, the brand ambassador. We've got Travis, who's uh, South African based, who's developed a cocktail for us this evening. Hopefully you'll have um, purchased some of the ingredients and will be ready to make the cocktail with us. And then we are coming back to UK and we'll be um, having a cocktail made for us by uh, Nicholas, who's one of the barmen from the Night Jar, which is, if anybody knows their cocktails, is one of the best cocktail bars in the world. So um, we've got a really jam-packed hour. Um, we're really privileged to have Lorna with us. I'm super excited about learning more about um, Inverosh, introducing the brand story to everybody and tasting some cracking cocktails. But before we get into um, flying down to South Africa and um, talking to Bo, I want to do a couple of housekeeping things. We always have a question and answer at the end of the show. We um, really encouraging questions from people. So please, if you've got a question which pops into your head and you want to ask Lorna, put it into the chat and hopefully um, we'll pick that up and we can ask Lorna at the end. We do in general have some, we open up the mics and become a little um, more uh, informal at the end after we've had a few drinks and hopefully we'll have some to and fro's with uh, Bo, potentially Nicholas and Lorna. Um, although we can't go on too late this evening, bearing in mind that uh, South Africa is two hours in, in front of us. Uh, so that's one bit of housekeeping. So please, yeah, any questions, pop them into the chat and we'll try and pick them up. The other thing, for those of you who are familiar with um, what we do at Sipping Rooms, we always have a competition. And um, we, the, the competition is to win a bottle of um, Inverosh. And the way you win this is by actually listening to what people are saying. And there'll be a word or a phrase, which is slightly unusual, which will come up um, three times during, the, um, during all of this. And, and it, it's maybe not said by one particular person. It could be um, three people in a row. Um, so you've got to keep your ears peeled for something which is slightly unusual, a word or a phrase. And... Um, yeah, we, in, in the past, we've had uh, Cheers and Cornish. We've had Wang It. Uh, we've had Tasting Glass in, in, uh, in Spanish when it came to our, our tequila brand last time. So it's something unusual. So keep your, keep your ears peeled. And the first person to guess it and put it into the chat will win a bottle of gin. Um, so uh, I think I've described everything which is going to be happening this evening. I hope you're sitting tight. I hope you've got a bottle of gin very close to hand. And we will be winging our way 
all the way down to Johannesburg to talk to Bo, who is the brand ambassador of Inverosh. And there she is with, with, with uh, the Inverosh in front of you. And you are going to introduce the range and the, uh, take us through the tasting. Um, so over to you, Bo. Can you guys hear me okay? Certainly can. Awesome. So, hi everyone, all the way from um, South Africa. Um, I just want to say what a privilege it is to actually be doing this with all of you in the UK and all around the world, essentially. Um, I am the South African brand ambassador for Embrosh, and I have been with Embrosh for a little over two years now. Um, and I must say, I am incredibly honored to be working for such an amazing brand. Um, not only is it founded by our amazing um, CEO, Lorna Scott, but it is also um, a company which um, creates employment amongst the local community, as well as um, a very female-led uh, workforce, which is incredible. Uh, being a female myself um, in a very male-dominated uh, industry, um, it's very, very inspiring. Um, just to get back to a little backstory that I love to tell about Embrosh and essentially how Lorna started this brand is that Lorna sat at her kitchen table back in 2009 and she began formulating these ideas to create this incredible range of gin. And it took her three years to come up with the perfect recipe. And uh, 2011, the very first batch of Embrosh was sold and was sold out of Lorna's house. So fast forward nine years later, and here we are sitting, talking to all of you in the UK. Um, I think it's just such an amazing story to see how far the brand has really come. I think one of, um, and I'm sure Lorna will go into a lot more detail about this, but I think one of Lorna's inspirations on creating this brand um, was something called the Cape Floral Kingdom. And essentially, it's a floral biome down in the Western Cape. It's one of six in the world. And it is, um, or they say that we have over 9,500 different species of plants and vegetation which grow within this biome, 70% of which can only be found here in South Africa, on the very southern tip of Africa. And to give you guys a little idea um, or a little perspective on this. They say that we have more plants and species growing just on Table Mountain than the entire UK has. This is pretty fascinating. <laughs> and what Lorna did with the three um, of our core gins, our classic, our present and our amber, is that each one of them represents a region within the Cape Floral Kingdom. So the first one, our classic, represents the limestone region. Uh, the Vedanta represents the mountainous region, and of course, the one that we will be tasting tonight, which is the amber, represents the coastal region. So just um, to prepare for the actual tasting, I just want to let you guys know how it will all go down. Um, first, we will be tasting the gin meat. We will then add a citrus zest, which I hope you all have in front of you. And then we will be putting a little splash of tonic into the gin. So first thing I want you all to do is just open your bottle of amber. We are going to pour around about 10 moles, 10 to 15 moles into our glass. I think I've poured a little bit more, which is okay. I hope you're all following. No, nothing wrong with pouring a bit too much. No, nothing wrong, <laughs> especially when it's 10 o'clock at night in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first thing I want you all to do is just pick up your glass of gin, um, tilt it at a slight angle, sort of a 45 degree angle, and just give it a gentle swirl. Just swirl the liquid around the glass. Hold it up against the light, and you should actually see a little curtain forming um, of the liquid around the glass. Give it a couple of minutes, or a couple, not even minutes, sorry, seconds, and you should see um, some of the drops kind of dripping down, and that's what we call the legs. And this essentially indicates uh, the viscosity of the gin, and it indicates the high quality of the liquid. Now, um, I want you to also just notice the color of the gin. So the color is in absolutely incredible, unique, very strange color for a gin as well. And it was definitely a first of its kind in South Africa. Um, to give you guys an idea, we currently have a, close to 400 different craft gins or local gins within our market. And there is a number of Amberosh, uh, sorry, not Amberosh, there is a number of Amber variants out there. Um, we were the very first to produce an Amber. And essentially we have, or Lorna Scott has pioneered a new style of gin, which is an amber style of gin. It's pretty cool, but it was also the first of its kind, like I said. Um, I don't think anybody had ever seen um, a color like this on a gin. 
Next thing I want you guys to all do is we are going to nose it in. So just put it under your nose. And we are just going to smell it. And you'll notice that this is a very rich and aromatic tin. So immediately, as you smell it, you get these really rich sort of aromas that come from it. Things like a burnt sugar, a musky rose, and a touch of rooibos. I'm not sure. I'm sure you guys are all aware of rooibos. It is um, also a type of sambal. Um, but just on the nose as well, it is very, very rich. Um, the color also of the gin comes from um, the botanicals that are used. And one of the lead botanicals in our amber gin is something called sour figs. So these grow along the coast of um, Africa, and they kind of look like this. So I've got one with me. I'm not sure if you guys can all see. We can see it, yeah. Very sort of strange looking botanical. Um, when they are slightly fresh, you can actually break them open, and inside they've got this sort of sticky liquid and these seeds, and you can eat them, and they've got this really incredible sort of sweet and sour and savory taste. Um, to them. And that's what essentially gives the amber its um, color and that sort of woody character to it. Next thing, we are going to take a little sip of our gin meat. Just a little sip, not too much. It's so rich, it's isn't it? It's delicious. <laughs> mm. So we're just going to coat our palate with it. Um, just give it a few seconds and then you can swallow. And on the palate, you will sort of find um, these incredible flavors of almost like a sweet toffee apple, um, a little bit of saffron. You get a little bit of like a bright citrus and a cinnamon. And then right at the end, as you swallow, it leaves you with a very, very interesting sort of dry woody finish to the gin, which is probably my favorite part because it's not necessarily what you would expect from a gin. So once you guys um, have swallowed, we are going to take our own vest. I hope you all have your own vest in front of you. Here's mine. And what you're going to do is, and I hope you guys can see this, we're going to take this vest, we're just going to give it a gentle twist or a little squeeze and just kind of feel um, and make sure that those oils within the zest are kind of releasing. It gets a little bit oily and we're just going to drop it into our glass. So once again, we are going to just Give it a little gentle nose. And now you'll notice that that citrus comes up quite brightly and it kind of tones down that woodiness of the actual gin. We're going to have a little sip. And once again, you'll notice that the zest actually makes quite a difference. It sort of softens the gin a little bit, but it also brings out a little bit more of a fruity characteristic within it. The next thing I want you all to do, I hope you're all following, is we are going to take our tonic water. Um, I believe that you all have a London Essence Indian tonic. Indian tonic is generally what works really, really well with our Embarrage Amber because it is so rich and aromatic. You kind of want to use an Indian tonic just so that you can experience that flavor. And we're going to take, we're going to do a little splash in our gin. So the ratio generally when doing a tasting is you kind of want to do one part um, gin to two parts tonic. So give it a little splash. And once again, we're going to have a little taste of our Embrosh Amber. So this is honestly um, one of South Africa's favorite gin. This gin sells, um, it is the most popular one of the bunch. Everybody absolutely loves this. And when I'm doing tastings, I always ask, what is your favorite Embrosh variant, and everyone always says to me, Amber. So it's always the one that generally people rec recommend. Um, it also works absolutely amazing in any cocktails. Um, if you have a really cool um, try and a Negroni with it, uh, it's one of my favorite cocktails with one of my favorite variants. It works absolutely amazing. So if you guys would um, like to find out a little bit more, please follow me um, on my Instagram handle, uh, bow underscore saunders underscore. Otherwise, you can follow um, the Embrosh page um, at, at Embrosh. And then we also have a page in the UK, which is um, at Embrosh underscore UK. So thank you so much. And I hope everyone enjoyed that and enjoy the rest of the evening. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, both. Um, and it, I was amazed the first time that Lorna took us through this whole ritual 
it was it was just great to understand the precision behind her thought process 100%. about and it, is, it, you know, is, it is exactly that it's a ritual um, yeah absolutely and it yeah. really brought the whole the whole brand to life in just a very simple explanation right okay this is how you taste it and I think that that was just it was like a kind of light bulb moment for me because it's like yeah. wow that this every every little detail has been thought out and mm -hmm. I love the precision around that I love the precision about actually this you know this is exactly the way you should taste it but it's a lot of brands I think oh well you know it goes quite well with a bit of lime or you know put some juniper yeah. berries in it or whatever but no this was like this is the way it's got to be done this is glass this is the, the 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 ritual and then it's like wow this is absolutely brilliant it was just uh yeah it was really completely different from how so many people approach it and yeah i've completely fell in love with the whole that whole idea so thank you for taking us through it and i'm sure no people from the people at uh, home i can see absolutely loving it already um so uh, I think what's yeah. also so interesting is that um you know with with this tasting it kind of takes you through the entire process of the gin. You go from the neat gin, then you experience it with your death, and it shows you um when the correct death is used with the correct gin, what the difference is and how it makes the difference. Um, yeah. and then of course you add the tonic for the purpose of it, which is how you essentially at the end of the day supposed to enjoy it. Absolutely. And I love the way the, the citrus kind of highlights some bits, softens other bits and just completely melds through thought process is absolutely brilliant. So thank you so much for taking us through that. Actually, I, I've not tried a Negroni with it yet, I don't think. So Negroni being one of my favorite things, I need to uh, I need to do a bit of um, a bit of experimentation. Do you have a particular vermouth or, or um, anything which you, you would use with that? Is there any particular favorites with you? Uh, listen, I have worked for um, other liquor companies, which I did do a lot of other vermouths, but I think one of my favorite vermouths would probably be the Antica formula. Yeah. Um, it's just a high quality vermouth, and it, I think it goes really, really well with um, the Embrush Amber. Brilliant. Okay, Bo, well, thanks for doing going through that. I think you are sticking about for some um, questions later, um, okay. so hopefully you'll be, you'll be able to stay on. We are now traveling all the way from uh, Johannesburg to go and see um, Travis, who is waiting for us in um, Cape Town. And there he is, the man himself. So um, welcome, Travis. Thank you so much you. for um, being here this evening on Sipping Rooms. Um, could, you, could you just uh, explain a little bit about your connection and history with, with Inverosh and um, why, you're, why you're doing the cocktail with us this evening? Absolutely, but before I do that, I just wanna say a massive shout out to all the South African people who tuned in and who uh, kind of meant so like a like dropping on some Afrikaans here so that you can feel a little taste of home. And uh, then I'll just give you a broad stroke about me. Um, so I'm a bartender and I've been a bartender for 20 years competitively, um, mainly in the realm of flair. Um, but like most recently, I suppose, like most bartenders, they, they put the flair down and then they begin to express themselves in the world of mixology, which is where I find myself now. And uh, yeah, I've just been competing in a couple of competitions. And, you know, in, in reality, I actually wasn't looking to enter any competitions last year. This is 2019 now. Um, but this, this competition was just something that I really had to do. And I'm talking about the Pioneers competition now. And we talk about pioneers, we talk about people who pioneer gin, but not only are they pioneering South African gin globally now, but they're also pioneering new and creative ways of, of um, hosting competitions because bartenders will always um, look at ways in which they can express themselves and showcase their skills, which would differentiate themselves from other bartenders. And most of the time, bartenders use that medium of competitions um, to do that. And... Uh, I suppose this was just something that I wanted to do. I mean, the, the, the first prize was an amazing prize. If you won the competition, the Pioneers competition, this is. It was a national competition right between Durban, um, Joburg and Cape Town. And if you won it, um, you had a very unique chance to make your own gin variant along with Inverash, which is exactly what I've done now. Hitting the markets about two months ago, we're on the roadshow now. And uh, so I got to produce my own gin line 
called Pioneers Collection One, um, which um, I went down to the brand home. Uh, this is now the beginning of 2020 now already, unfortunately, COVID kind of um, elongated the whole process. But I went down there and I spent um, a weekend there, two days with Mike, uh, who's the master distiller. Uh, and the two of us, we just came up with a, a luxury gin, which would stand alongside the entire portfolio. And that's why I'm here today, because I'm the winner of the very first Pioneers collection. And they got me on to showcase Inbrosh Amber and, uh, and, and a beautiful cocktail. Um, Tra Travis, uh, we've got a slight problem with um, the fact that we can't see you at the moment. We can hear you, but we can't see you. Um, yeah, I see it's gone uh, dead there. It's this pole. Uh, there we go. Um, there sorry, we go. The, it's, 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 the, it's the poles which we've put in, in on this evening. So unfortunately, yeah, I, I yeah. didn't realise that when poles come up, the, um, the, uh, the we can't see you. So sorry about that. Our fault, not yours. <laughs> we no, can see no, you now in all your glory now when we do the um yeah you can see me in all my glory yeah now so now we're doing the the, the demo so now it's a perfect time yeah absolutely absolutely so um can you can you now talk us through our um our cocktail yeah i'm just gonna adjust my camera so you can see what i'm doing there. Is that okay for me? yeah Absolutely, can see you perfectly. Good setup. Okay, so um, when Alex Farnell, who's the GM of Inbrush, he, he approached me to be involved in the sipping rooms and you know, he gave me a brief to develop a drink. And um, you know, the idea is to, is, is to develop something which is simple, which everybody can create at home. Um, obviously, a beautiful balance, great tasting. It's gotta be super delicate, you know, and uh, Possibly not, nothing too boozy, so let's try and lengthen it, uh, which is speaking to myself as a bartender right now. I mean, I love the idea of highballs and gin and tonics. I love the idea of, uh, of lengthening drinks for the summer. We're approaching our summer now. I believe the UK is going into winter. Sorry about that. It certainly but, is. It's absolutely freezing here. It's freezing. You're, yeah, it's uh, absolutely freezing. Yeah. Like I'm, a, I'm a total child of the sun, like a product of Africa. And for me, everything needs to be like really, really, really warm and i'll drop another afrikaans word they call blixem so everything for me has got to be blixem savarum which is extremely extremely um, hot um and so the drink is, is is now for us leading into our summer it's going to be um a take on a perfect martini lengthened with uh, sparkling water or soda if you can get your hands on that um but uh, i need to speak to the accentuating notes of the orange because this is amber we're talking about here now as Bo was saying um, orange is actually a, a great flavor component that uh, goes beautifully with Inbrush Amber. And, and when you look at Inbrush Amber, I love the color of this. And when we're talking about the drink that I'm going to make now, I mean, you wouldn't be able to make a perfect martini um, you know, with, a, with a sort of amber looking uh, uh, liquid. And what we have right now actually allows us to, to play with colors within a martini or in a martini that you add soda to it. And um, if you just look at Inbrush Amber, it was like a really big thing for us here yeah, because in South Africa, we're like inundated with London dry gins and mm. you know, for Lorna to come out and so boldly create something so unique um, as Amber, which is something new, even for South Africa, never mind the global market mm. right now. You know, with something like, I mean, she's a big deal here for us. Um, you know, the UK and the rest of Europe is gonna find out really, really soon um, how beautiful and how amazing this gin is. I mean, that distinct color comes from the sour fig and uh, it also gives it a unique um, flavor as well. And most of the people, when they did the tasting with bow, they'll immediately um, identify that it's completely different to anything they've ever tasted, especially alone and dried. So we're going to use that as our base. And then <clears throat> I don't know if people are going to be following through with this drink as I've um, designed it, but like a perfect martini, I love the idea of having drinks whereby you can actually play with the different vermouths. So if you like something a little bit sweeter, then you can try mm -hmm. like a little bit more sweet vermouth. If you like something more drier, you can try like uh, more extra dry vermouth. So that's what I've done because I'm gonna balance um, the, the sweetness and the dryness together. But for those people who are following along and they only have the sweet vermouth, then you can go right ahead and do that. So before we get to the drink, we've spoken about the ammo. I'll just like outline very, very quickly what the other ingredients are. So I've got an extra dry vermouth here from the House of Martini. I've got this beautiful comparative. This is a, I don't know if you can see that, this is a sweet vermouth. Mm -hmm. 
So this is a purely South African vermouth, which they make like maybe an hour away from my house here in Malmesbury. And uh, it's made by a guy by the name of Audrey Bardenhorst. He he's a wine producer, but basically he got an old version of the Savoy cocktail book. And inside there, Caparitif is in like three different recipes. And he decided I'm going to recreate this because it says there's South African gin from the Transvaal. So he's actually rekindled and trying to rekindle this brand. And it's absolutely amazing, but it won't have that deep, deep red um, like, a, like a Rosso would have or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, then the next thing is just some uh, pure orange juice, which you can press or you can squeeze. You can even buy orange juice from the shop, super easy to get. Then I've got some, um, some orange liqueur here. So people who like a little bit sweeter, they can use a Contra or a triple sec or something like that. You know, I'm not really in love with sweet, sweet drinks right now. So I'm going to be using a dry orange. So it also has that beautiful amber color over there, but this is a dry mm -hmm. orange. It's got the beautiful orange notes, which is going to, completely go with the amber, but it's not going to be super sweet, like a triple sec would be, which, you know, adds to my sweetness. I don't know if you've lost me there. Again, another yeah, you, you have. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Travis. <laughs> no I'm worries. Full. No worries. And then we're going to dash it with some, um, some orange bitters. I'm going to use Angostura, but if you're using um, Regan's orange bitters or um, somebody else's orange bitters, um, that's totally fine. And then last but not least, we're going to do a bar spoon of a maraschino liqueur which is a clear liquid like this, made from the nuts of cherries. And, uh, you know, I wanted to use the bar spoon of this because, you know, I believe that one of the favorite things that I love about Inbrush Amber is that um, the floral notes that come through on the back end of the tasting notes. I don't know if anybody picked that up. And so I'm using the maraschino to complement those floral notes and draw them out of the Inbrush Amber at the same time. So you can follow with the, uh, the, the recipes as, as we go. But we're basically going to put in, I'm, I'm using a slightly taller glass, so I amended it to get like 10 to 15% more in there. But I'm going to be using 45 mils of Inbrush Amber Gin, um, a shot each of the orange juice, the comparative from the Martini Extra Dry. Uh, then I'm going to bang in 15 mils of the dry um, orange Curacao, two dashes of the, um, of the Angostura orange bitters, and then a blossom of the Maraschino liqueur. Are you with me there, Phil? Yeah, I am. I am. I'm. I'm. I'm going to try. I'm going to I, I, no, 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 no. It's fine. I, I, I stupidly didn't ask you before what kind of glass yeah. we're going to use. So, so I, I kind of got off an array of different glasses. So, um, okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, it's a hard glass, but any tall glass um, will do. Anything from uh, maybe 270 mils is, is, is too small, but yeah. 330 mils and upward would be perfect for something like this. Okay. Even if you wanted to have it in a martini style, you could. Put completely omit the, the sparkling water and just serve it straight up in a, in okay. a daisy glass or, or a stem martini or something like that. And uh, yeah, we're going to, we're going to serve it down over here. So we're not going to shake it because we want to be very delicate with, with the gin. Yeah. So, so it's a no shaking. Um, we'll just stir it down, get the temperature going, and then we'll, we'll, we'll pour it into our tall glass and then lengthen it with a little bit of sparkling water. And then we should be good to go. Fantastic. Let's go. Yeah. I'm on my way, just heading to the fridge real quick. Hang on a sec. Travis, you have got the best kitchen um, we've had on the show, I think, so far. You, you went on that. You. Yeah, you. yeah absolutely you. knocking it out of the park there. Really good. <laughs> I use my foot. <laughs> <laughs> There's a the glass like this, yeah, which I was just having chilling in the, oh, um, in the deep deep. Eye to detail deep there. Deep. Yeah, yeah, because chilling is obviously important for any drink, huh? Yeah, all, all I'd need to do this evening is to put my glass outside for about 10 minutes. It would be absolutely frozen within, within that time frame. Beautiful. I can't believe it's that cold, Phil, to be honest with you. Um, the last time I was in London, it was, uh, it was snowing and that was in 2012. So, um, yeah. I know exactly how cold it gets there. In fact, um, Lamashi and myself and Jody Francis, who's the other brand ambassador down here in Cape Town, in Russia, yeah. we went to, um, to London to do a couple of guest shifts there and, um, and a, and a, a beautiful, uh, Charlize Theron had a beautiful event that she was doing there and in Russia sponsored the whole thing. Um, and we flew down to make some drinks and dinner times for the guys. And that was cold. 
That's I've never experienced anything so cold before in my life. <laughs> okay, here we here. go. Super, super cold. Okay, so I'm going to go with 45 mils myself. Okay. Maybe because my glass is a little bit too big, but um, 35 mils if you have a normal highball glass. Yeah. For those people at home, I'm using this apparatus over here called the Jigger. So the small one is 15 mils and the big one is 30 mils. Also for Nicholas, the pro over there, who's probably wondering what size Jigger is that, you'll know. And I'm using this because it's easy to bang out these, these measurements um, with yeah. what I have. Here. Okay, so I'm going to go for a, a, a perfect balance here. This is called the Copal cocktail, by the way. A Copal is like, a, is amber when it... Um, uh, um, fossilizes, if you will. So if you've seen the movie um, Jurassic Park, when they've got that little mosquito inside that amber dome, that's called mm -hmm. a cobalt. So I was super inspired, obviously, by the color of, of amber, and that's where the name came from. Okay, then a shot of the sweet vermouth, shot of the orange juice. Yeah, this is the dry, the dry curacao. Uh, most people will probably be using Contra, which is totally fine. A couple of dashes of Angos. This is the orange one. And then a bar spoon of the maraschino. So maraschino can be um, hugely overpowering, so I just advise everybody to just um, take it easy with that and apply it with a bone spoon. Don't free pour it because um, the result will be catastrophic inside the drink. Then we're just going to give that a gentle stir, bring the temperature down. Fuller, are you following me there? Yep, absolutely. Whether we'll taste the same, we can never tell, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're using this, and the poem users will have this as a Hawthorne strain over here, just basically to keep the ice back when we strain the liquid out. I'll try and get a good pour for the camera here. Ah, oh, it's looking beautiful, Travis. Absolutely amazing. So we're just going to strain that out. I can hear your tools going in the background there, so I'm very, very impressed. Yeah. And then we decanted some um, sparkling water into a, a wine decanter here. And then we're just gonna cough that up. So obviously, like I was saying, if you wanted to have this in a martini style, then you would mm. serve this straight up in a, in a daisy yeah. glass. Straight up means no ice, obviously. Then we just top this one off. And then you can garnish it as you wish, really. I would suggest something like a, an orange slice or an orange wheel or something like that. Um, I went out into my garden and I got some fresh thyme. Oh, I should have gone and got, I've got thyme bush out the back. It's, it's probably a bit cold, but yeah, I should have done that, thought of that. One well, step ahead of me. Bush. It's almost English and almost Afrikaans at the same time. Yeah. But I'm using thyme and lime because it was actually uh, the garnish of the perfect serve um, for my gym, for PC1, for Pioneers Collection 1. So I've got tons of it around. So I'll just hold that up. I don't know if anybody can see that. That is looking absolutely beautiful. And I yeah. hope we can pan around and see a few more people's um, cocktails. Anybody who's made a cocktail at home, Put it yes, up to the camera I mean, and we want to see we want to see it around the world. We want to see what, what efforts people have made. <laughs> oh look at Finally. that. Yo. There we go. Fantastic. So Travis, thank you so much, buddy. That's just been amazing. And thank you, Paul. Ooh. Tastes great as well. Well, my one does anyway. Uh, hopefully everybody else's does. We've got all sorts going on here. Martini glasses, high balls, ah, fantastic rocks. Yeah, you go. People, people are, have really got into this. Fantastic. 
So thank you, Travis. That's been amazing. My pleasure, um, guys. Thank you. And I, I don't know whether you're hanging about. I know it's, I know it's a lot later in South Africa, so don't, don't worry if you if you need to shoot off now and not stay on for the uh, Q&A later, but um, you're more than welcome yeah, no to. Um, cool. Okay, we are now going to go and um, watch a little video, um, and then we have got the privilege of um, having a presentation from Lorna Scott herself, um, which will be absolutely amazing. So first off, here's a little video for you all. In the rush, it's like walking through the felt on a hot summer's day after the rain has just fallen. Rich, floral, earthiness. The discovery of an awesome story was the thing I wanted to tell by making Jim. It's about this very close relationship between the environment and man and how we use the very plants from which we make our gins to sustain ourselves two millennia ago, and so therefore they stay here. What I wanted to do is start a conversation so that when you're sitting at a table and you're sharing this awesome tasting gin, wherever you are, you have a connection to this particular place because this is our common origin. What grows here grows nowhere else on the entire planet. And what makes it so extra special is that it's these plants that we now make our gins from. And so it really means way more than just finding ingredients that are unique. These are ingredients that can tell stories. was envisioned to tell a broader story. It was not just about the gin. The gin really was, in a way, a vehicle for me to tell that awesome story of where we are. So without further ado, we are going to go to um, Stilbay in South Africa, and uh, there should be Lorna waiting for us. Lorna, are you there? There we go. Technology. Yes, I can. I can, Lorna. That was that was almost seamless. It was almost seamless. There we go. So, okay. um, so yeah. I will before um, without further ado, I will hand over to you. And you can tell us more about the brand and um, straight from the founder's kitchen. I think it is you're talking to us from. Yeah, not, not quite the kitchen, the office, but kitchen is just over there. Um, Phil, thank you very much. I think to begin with, um, again, a great honor to be able to talk to so many people in so many different parts of the world. And Travis, again, as always, you know, you just personify what the brand is all about. It's all about creativity. It's about finding um, new ways of creating something from what you've got around you and what inspires you. And that connection to a place, which is what you just heard me talk about in the video, is really what I believe lies at the very heart of what it means to be human and what this brand is all about. And just by the way, if you are in the UK, which I believe many of you are, it's also amazing to have the amber just neat. It takes the edge off, needless to say, but it also is just perfect just to cradle it in a, maybe in a, in a balloon glass, brandy snifter next to the fire, I lived in Scotland for, you know, a very, very long time. My children are all, were all, you know, born there. And there's nothing better to take you home to Africa when you're sitting next to the fire in a really cold winter's evening. So just bear that in mind. You don't just have to have it as a cocktail or in a traditional gin and tonic. I think the Two questions that um, Phil had asked me to kind of deal with in, in my, my allotted time. 
is to give you a little bit of insight about why I started the brand and, and how yeah, I got from where we were, what inspired me to, to do it, but also to maybe just tell you about what makes it unique. And as this whole experience tonight is about you engaging with all of your senses, it's all about that intensely sensory experience that really reminds us of being human and that defines our humanity is how we interact by communication, by connecting to other people and also by connecting through our senses to the natural world. And it's that experience, I think, that would be more meaningful for you when you're sitting there with this delicious cocktail that you've just made, or if you haven't made it, as I say, just put a dash of the amber in a, in a, in a glass, in a, just in a little uh, tumbler, and just do it now. You know, close your eyes and you'll be transported right back to the place where it all began. And it will help you to understand how we make this gin. So I'm going to go start with that, and then I'll come back to why I'm, I started the brand. And the, one of the most extraordinary things that so few people realize about in Mirage is that it actually takes us more than a year to create our gins because of the fact that the process that I discovered, and I, I didn't know anything about making gin. I had to teach myself. My son was, you know, a great help um, with a, a, a truly superb nose and a palate that was, um, you know, un, un, unbelievably useful. Um, and so this process that we developed was really driven by the ingredients that I discovered. And um, you, as we're dealing with the amber today, I've picked these out of my garden this afternoon when I came home. So I have here, um, this here, if you can see it, is buchu. Um, and this is what features quite prominently in our classic, for example. You can't smell it, but let me tell you, this is just like a powerhouse of, you know, rich citrusy notes that just really opens up the whole sensory experience. And that is one of the, um, the ones that I had to find a way of capturing those very delicate, tiny little leaves. Now, Feinbos, by the way, I do ramble, so I don't prepare speeches, so I just go with, with where it's going. But you've heard us call these amazing botanicals Feinbos. In, in Afrikaans, it's Feinbos, and in English, fine bush refers to these little tiny leaves. So can you see that? So it means fine-leafed plants. And even though they have a lot of, many of them of these nine and a half thousand plants that have berries and flowers, we use different parts of different um, of, the, of these uh, botanicals in different ways for each one of the three gyms that we make. Um, this here, for example, is Mpepu or Kuihut. Whole story I can tell you about this, but we don't have time about this, which again, you'll find in the Verdant. Um, they used to stuff their mattresses and Afrikaans bedding is known as Kuihut, so a kui, a kui is a thing you sleep on. And so this kept away all the bugs and the mosquitoes and it smells amazing. And you could just pick a little bit of this out of your mattress if your kid had some, um, you know, um, was crying, your baby, or you had a slight cough and you could just make an infusion in your tea or burn it and there you go. And then of course we've got the little pelagoniums here and I've got a little sierfege here. The sierfege is that sour fig that we spoke about earlier on. And by the way, discovering the way to use all of these things was part of the creative journey that I had to undertake to create the recipes. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this one because I just love how this all came about. Usually these little sierfegis um, are turned into jam and you use them when they're fresh and then you peel them because the outside of this has got this really sort of um, quite a defined um, woody husk around it and the fruit is inside so you have to peel them and it's a hellish job because it's quite a tricky little thing to peel. I just gave up trying after a while because my fingers just couldn't take it anymore peeling these bloody little things so I just decided to put them in whole in my little baby pot store that we did all these experiments in. And I discovered that by doing that, I extracted in the process 
these woody notes from the husk of the of the sir feighi and the extraordinary flavor that everybody was throwing the stuff away and we just decided to use them whole is as you now know one of the key characteristics of of the amber so where i'm leading with all of this is that the creative process that you you know going through tonight to engage with your senses is fundamental to how we make it and the 12 months of the detects is that we harvest every botanical at different periods throughout the year that you know they bloom at certain times and we've got to harvest them we either make tinctures or we dry them um, and then we use some of them fresh so when you get a bottle of enroche um, and you get it off the shelf you'll often find that the the color changes and it's one of the things that you should cherish because every season brings its own unique character and we capture that because everything is completely natural there's no artificial elements of anything and the one shot um, distillation process that we use is enhanced through a post distillation where we take a number of the botanicals that we've already used in the distillation and in the in the tinctures which is part of the the, um, the the main body of the distillation um, um, ingredients and we put it in again afterwards and that's where the color comes from and when I originally designed all of this I just thought it just looked so cool I mean you can see that you know look look at this amazing color you know just hold it up against the light here so look at that I mean it just sparkles and shines why on earth would you want to filter that out which is what people do so I took a chance and just did it and left it like that. And, you know, despite the fact that I had many women telling me that nobody's going to drink brown gin, there you go. It's the market leader. And it is also, as you've heard earlier, it started an entire trend of not just ambers, but people being encouraged to be creative and using you know, the marvelous um, cornucopia of indigenous plants in, in South Africa to create more and more wonderful things. So I'm going to stop there with that bit because I'm watching this big clock of mine and I've only got five minutes left to tell you the whole big story of why I started all of this. So at the base of all of this, I discovered the fact that where we are in Still Bay, which is where the distillery is at the southern tip of Africa, that within a radius of about 50 kilometers that we have the origin of modern humans through the archeological discoveries that were made here at Blombos Caves and at Pinnacle Point, which are two archeological sites. And it's all about how humans had survived 150,000 years ago here at the Southern tip of Africa and through the abundance of food available only here on the whole planet, of which the Fainbos was a critical component, combined with, of course, shellfish. And I have a, an example for you here that this also is, this is an abalone shell. And this is also one of the artifacts, not this specific one, but an abalone shell like this that they found at Blombos Caves, dating back 75,000 years ago. It's the oldest artifact found on the planet that indicates that this was used to grind up some ochre and different other ingredients. Ochre, by the way, looks like that. And they used this to paint their bodies and created um, art um, for the first time. So the cradle of creativity was brought about through our um, survival of um, being that connection with the plants that helped us to survive and to identify them. And if you think about how amazing that history is of not only survival, but how we learn to collaborate and move from you know, a small band of survivors at the southern tip of Africa to now be the, you know, the dominant species on the planet. And the fact that we are all connected to this place and to each other was the, the incredible story that I wanted to share. And I didn't set out to just make gin. I just wanted to find a way of creating something that would be infused with history and that would create hope because we are all one family. We're all 
have a connection to each other and to this place. And I think in particular where we are now with grief, will Donald Trump please leave now, um, that we have to find opportunities to create the conversations about what we have in common and not about the things that make us different. And so what better than to have a, a gin like an amber or a verdant or a classic and put that on a table and share that with your friends and start conversations about what's in it and why that matters and that that connection will hopefully lead to finding those commonalities that bind us rather than, than separate us. And I think my time is up, Phil. Um, I can talk Look, to you for hours, but I'll stop there for- I, I know, uh, Lorna, I, I feel bad because your story and the story of Inverosh is so deep and there's so many layers to what you're talking about. It's just amazing. And I can remember when you first, did our um, session uh, when you came across, and I think it was in February. I was just absolutely blown away by the whole the whole thing, and you know, you passing around these artifacts, which were you know, the tens of thousands of years old, which was kind of slightly. I'd, I'd never been to a gin tasting uh, immersion before, where you had any sort of archaeological finds. <laughs> um, so that was amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, we are going to go and have do another cocktail, but we will be back. And I know it's late in South Africa, but we've got questions for you. And if you if you can stay up for a little bit longer, we will we will go through those. And um, I'm going to put a splash of amber in my coffee, and I'll be with you for as long as you need me. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so so much, Rona. And we'll be back soon. We are now going to flick. Um, to back to the UK, and we are going to go to, I believe it's uh, East London. Here we are. We've got the we've uh, got the Italians, the Italians <laughs> in uh, in East London. Hi guys, how are you? Hi everyone. So first, everyone can hear me properly. Yes, absolutely, loud and clear. No problem at all. Great, so I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Nicholas. I'm working in Niger in London for about one year and a half, and I'm in hospitality for, for about six years. So I'm really thankful. Thank you for, for the honor to be here to make a drink for you and have a little bit little inspiration for this amazing product in Barrage. So honestly, try the product behind the bar. I try all of them. And I was really, really interested about the, the amber one, about the color, the, um, obviously the aromatic flavor it has. And also we talked about before the buku that you use, not in this one, but the, the other one. Uh, honestly, we use behind the bar. So, so I quite, um, uh, we use it in a drink just to, to give more flavor. And uh, it's really, really interesting. So about the amber, uh, obviously I wasn't uh, really, really interested about the, the aromatic flavor, the wood flavor that he has really deep. And uh, I decided to create something uh, really Christmassy. So it's, it's gonna be like a gin eyeball with a touch of Christmas in, in it. So it's really simple cocktail that you can make at home. Just what you need is a, is a glass with ice, obviously in garage. And I made a little preparation that is a mullet um, apple spice. So you can take like your favorite, uh, your favorite uh, apple juice or fresh pressed apple juice. Uh, you warm it up, you add your, um, your favorite spice. In this case, we add a bit of lemon peel, orange peel, cinnamon, clove, a little bit more Christmas flavor on it. Then you let it infuse for a, for a few hours, just chill it and then it's ready to use. In this drink, you can also make in a, in a hot version, like in a hot toddy uh, style, let's say, so you can keep warm. So you infuse the botanical, you, you strain, and you add the gin, and you drink it warm. So there's like two, two different versions of it. So I'm gonna start to make it like in a, in a chill glass. So simple, what you need is a chill glass, uh, ice chill, a glass and a, and a spoon. Obviously, I'm gonna use the, the jigger, you can use um, a coffee cup, I'm gonna add 50 ml of in the roche. Simple that. Then I made obviously the mullet apple wine. It's quite common in England to make a mullet, mullet wine during the Christmas time. So I mean, with the wine, maybe we probably cover the taste of gin. So I decided to make with, uh, with apple juice 
uh, because it's a bit more delicate and balanced flavor. And then we're gonna top it up with a bit of uh, tonic or soda water. Which one you prefer? I mean, like whatever you prefer at all. Quick stir with a glass to mix everything together. I'm gonna garnish with a bit of cinnamon stick, orange peel to give a bit of extra flavor, and obviously a lovely slice of apple. So simple as that. You can enjoy at home in a quarantine. So it's really simple, quick to make. Enjoy, guys. Okay, you're quick. I'm halfway through making mine. <laughs> I, need, I, need, I need to make mine and then I, I'm, okay. I'm going to taste it with you. I mean, come on. You, you, yeah. you know, you, you may work in the best uh, bar in the world, but I, I need to get my money's worth out of, out of trying to copy what the, one of the best bartenders in the world is doing. You've, you've caught me on the hop here. So, um, <laughs> I mean, so, we're, uh, we're quite busy at the night, night so I'm, I'm quite quick to make drinks. Anyway, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, 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 was thinking, I was thinking to make a drink for home, really simple, nothing crazy, nothing like having a proper liqueur or vermouth or stuff that maybe so, someone doesn't have. So I think apple juice and a, a few spice everyone has at home. You can play with it. You can have it warm. You can have it in chill. Uh, it has a really good flavor, rich, obviously, really, really interested color. Um, and uh, obviously the, the heat from the Christmas uh, spice it's quite powerful, powerful, but they, they really pair with the with the Inverosh flavor, I, I think. Right. Okay. I'm adding my last ingredient here. Here we go. I, I think that this would be amazing as a hot toddy. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm definitely going to try that because yeah, the thing thing which amazes me about um, the amber is that it is very versatile. I mean, it, you can drink it by itself. You can literally. It's a. It's a it's a sipping gin in my my opinion but then it's it can flip into so many different cocktails oh, um and and it's got got that lovely kind of woody warmness to it which goes so well with i think the cinnamon i'm going to taste test this oh yeah that's great so it is kind of can be autumnal for something which is from South Africa. It flips so well into something which is designed for this time of the year in, in the UK. So yeah, really clever. Well done on that. That's um, that's great. Now I think what we need to do is to go around and see um, other people who have made their versions because I know I was, I was probably a bit slow on that one, but probably people a bit quicker than me even though I used to be behind a bar for 15 years. Um, okay, so we'll flip around and see see who's... who's um, oh, fantastic. Here we go, guys. Cheers, cheers. Here we've got apple garnishes. I've just got a bit of cinnamon stick floating about in mine. Just going to poke me in the eye in a second. Oh, now that look, does look professional. Here's one. Uh, oh, yeah, there we go. Brilliant. Emil, that's, that's, you've, you've, you've made that properly. I can see that. <laughs> Hello. Fantastic. Okay. Nicholas, thank you so much for that. And that's a, a, a real masterclass from someone who uh, works in what is regarded as one of the top um, cocktail bars in the world. Um, we've all, for those people who haven't been on sipping rooms before, we always have um, had the philosophy that we would have a um, barman or bar girl from one of the um, on trade accounts who we've got great relationship with because the on trade in the UK as is happening in, across the world is in a really 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 bad state because of lockdown etc so yeah we once lockdown's finished we need to get back into these places we need to show support um uh because they are the lifeline which keep people happy when when uh covid isn't about the place so big big thing for us on sipping rooms to make sure that we keep on reminding people that okay drinking at home and doing these sessions is fun but you know, once uh, COVID comes, 
uh, is, is past, then we need to get back into these amazing places like Nightjar, where people really look after you, got a huge passion about the drinks and come up with amazing cocktails um, and do what they love. So, yeah, that's why that's why we have always people from um, the on trade uh, featuring on Sipping Room. So thank you so much for that, Nicholas. And hopefully it won't be too long before we'll be back into Night Jar and uh, tasting some of your of your, your creations firsthand. Hope to see you soon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we are now going to go into our question and answer session. So um, I've got a load of questions which have been sent in from people. Please. Um, as I said before, if anybody's got any pressing questions which they want to ask Lorna, um, put them into chat and we'll hopefully get, get through them. We can't, I don't think we can go for a late one because it's coming up to, it's coming up to, well, it's another 20 minutes will be midnight in South Africa. So we can't, can't go on too late with Lorna, but uh, I know that our usual crowd on here will probably want to keep me up late this evening um anyway uh before further ado we shall go and go back to south africa where we've got Bo and we've got lorna and i've got some questions um so charlie if you can go back to uh lorna that'd be fantastic lorna we're back, back to you and your coffee and uh, and Amber. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. It's probably it's it's probably the most said phrase in in twenty twenty. Sorry, I can't can hear you. Hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I I, I um. Uh, uh, did you did you follow Nicholas's cocktail there? Was... I did, and I'm definitely. You know, we need to have these recipes available. Can we get them somewhere? So can we post it? it would be on your site. Yeah, I think so. I I know that it was um it was circulated. The the, the recipe was circulated with everybody um who signed up. So it's 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 there. We we just okay. we can share that with you. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah. So obviously, night jar is being like the the um place to go and go in London over the last few years. Um, Lorna, I've got a question myself, which I hadn't thought of before, but when you were talking about um, your thought process of going through and, uh, you know, developing um, your range, you'd spent quite a lot of time in Scotland. Um, as you said, you, all your children have been born there. When you came up with Amber, as a gin, that is a very unique thing. And the color, if you put it up, you know, it, it looks pretty like a whiskey. Was that a, 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 a kind of a, a link back to your, your time in Scotland? I think I have to say yes. Um, I am actually, I, I do like my whiskey, but the connection to, you know, a, a, a spirit that is, like an age spirit that you could, you know, that you could enjoy in the same way, yet that has the lightness and the complexity um, of a gin, really was a surprise. And that's why I mentioned that earlier, you know, one of the ways I like to drink the amber is just neat. Um, and yes, I think it does hark back to, you know, those cold winter evenings in Hoy and um, in, um, in Lochinber. So, <laughs> so yes. <laughs> and I suppose there's a uh, there's a nod towards Scotland in the in the name as well. I mean Inverness, oh. and you know that's that's very Scottish, Scottish sounding um, name in a way. Well, it celebrates. Um, it, it was very specific because it kind of brings together my ancestors, so, you know, my Scottish heritage as well as my um, Huguenot heritage. So the French word, which is Inver. Um, or rather, the, the, which is Roche, which refers to the limestone area that our lime, that our uh, distillery is built in, are built uh, around. And of course, Inver, Inver Roche, 
Um, in my children were born, one of them in, in, in Inverness, for example. So it means where the rivers come together and go out into the ocean. So it's the confluence of, of waters and the coming together. And it celebrates that cycle of life with um, water giving, um, going through the rock, through the limestone and giving life to Feinbos, which is also where the logo comes from, which is our Inverosh logo. So it celebrates my heritage and it speaks about our connection to the, to the earth. Yeah, I think, it, it, as I said before, your your story has got so many different levels to it. I, mean, I think a lot of people would be just like, oh, you know, we, we came up with this name and this is the connection. And that would probably be their marketing message. But you know, <laughs> you've got so, so much, you've got so much with, with the completely unique um, story around the phone boss. You know, that, that's just incredible that you you bring all of your botanicals in from this completely unique area of the world I mean it is you can't replicate that you can't just say oh well you know we're bringing our this from China well, yeah, and this from there the you know this place. this is the, the, yeah. you, you can't you can't replicate that can you it's just no, so but I mean that's the whole point of <clears throat> having infused them in in the spirit I mean the beauty of gin is always the thing that I find so amazing because it gives you an opportunity to work with different botanicals in, in much the same way as an artist uses a palette of colors. I was able to paint with flavors and aromas and infusing that into a neutral spirit because I mean, as everybody who's here mm -hmm. I'm sure know, um, you know, the, the alcohol is just the the, the base and the flavor profile of the gin or the botanicals. So what a perfect way of capturing, you know, the essence of a place and of a time and of history and, and of the senses than a gin, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose um, segues into one of the questions which was sent through to us. Um, you've got so much variety where you are. I, I mean, there's the, uh, I think Bo mentioned the fact that you know, on Tabletop Mountain you've got more um, species uh, of, of of flower than than varietals of flower than uh, anywhere in the UK. I mean, that's just incredible. Um, so, how did you go through that process, and how long was that process of actually refining that? You know, it, because sometimes choice. <laughs> Can be it can be almost worse than having a, um, a dearth of things because you you can get confused about what you're actually trying to achieve that you could be you put trying to put too much into something. How how did you actually go? Okay, well this is what I'm trying to achieve, and how do I get there? Um, I was very fortunate where I live in Stoll Bay we have an additional resource which is completely undervalued and underappreciated globally, I think, and that is the retired community. Um, so I had the good fortune of having a number of um, uh, friends and acquaintances who became aware of my quest that were bot botanists and also, of course, archeologists, but mainly botanists and retired um, uh, um, 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 distillers and so on who were all happy to share their knowledge and their experience with me and so they taught me I went out with two of them the, the late um, Dr. Tor Pinar and, and his wife Annette um, she's still she's 79 this year she still helps me she's still involved in you know all my experimentations and finding new botanicals so they drew up a list of about 300 um, Feinboss botanicals that were all edible or medicinal that has the potential to be used in the way that I wanted to use it. And over a period of about three years with my little baby Potstall and with Tall and with Annette by my side and my son, we played around with all the different botanicals to find out what did they taste like? What could we do with them? And I developed a flavor wheel based on the essence of the juniper berry that helped me to you know, dissect the core characteristics that must be present in a gin. And I went looking for flavors within this 300 uh, different um, Feinbos species that would you know, fit into a citrus profile or a floral profile or a woody profile and so on. 
And in the end, those three gins that we ended up as a portfolio kind of made themselves because it, I didn't mm. set to just create a gin that was representative of a, you know, the, the, re, the region like Amber is of the coastal area. They just work well together. So that was almost as if serendipity led me through this path. But of course, with the help of people like um, Annette and, and Tol. So th that's how we did it. And we ended up with, you know, a handful of, uh, and a total of about 30 odd different botanicals that are the core essence of what we use and continue to use with new iterations like the, the Pioneers collection or our creative collection and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. So um, you didn't come from a distillation background. Do you think that the fact that you didn't have any preconceptions about things actually um, give you an advantage that you just weren't kind of ha didn't have any kind of shackles about, OK, well, this is the way things have got to be done, that you just came with a completely fresh mind to things? Yeah, th that's very much a leading question. And the answer to that is an absolute, you know, yes because I really didn't know the first thing about it. And I do believe that when you um, are completely open to be inspired by, you know, what you discover, and it's, again, it's that idea of serendipity that, you know, things come together in unexpected ways. And if you have preconceived ideas of what something should be, you shut out the potential to be truly creative. And at the, at the end, you know, when I speak about the, the inspiration behind my brand it's all about creativity that is at the base of us being human so to be mm. open to that you have to kind of discard what is um, the norm and be open to find new ways of doing things yeah absolutely and we've there are a couple of questions coming through here um obviously we talk a lot about the the botanicals but the actual base spirit, and Bo was talking about the, the legs on it and the kind of quality around that. The, the base spirit, what, what, what goes into that? Is there anything particularly unique or is it just a, yeah, a, a again, normal? Uh, what, what I did is I just followed instinct more than anything else. And as most of, the, of our participants to, tonight um, will know that the, it's, it's usually because of convenience that base spirits um, are used and predominantly where gins were traditionally made, grain, you know, whiskey, you know, you make whiskey in, in, in the UK um, or in, in Europe, you know, it would be grapes, for example, because mm. the wine's being produced. So the, the basis is um, used usually as either grapes or, or grain or, you know, in some cases, even, you know, potatoes and so on to, mm, to mm -hmm. the spirit, but they all have a lingering back note. And it's that lingering back note that is slightly, if you think about whiskey, it has that kind of hasty, um, you know, um, um, that stays there. And the only one that doesn't do that is when you use a, a spirit that's, that's distilled from molasses, or a cane spirit, or, you know, made from sugar cane, because it only has a subtle, sweet lingering note, but it is clear and the best neutral base, particularly when you're working with florals predominantly as I do. And do you think that that marries a lot better with the, with the botanicals which you're using? Is that, yes. is that just a much, much better link in with yeah, I tried okay. I tried working with you know grain based um, spirit mm -hmm. and also grape and it just brings a note that um, interferes with the purity of the flavor profile that I believe the our three gins um, represent yes yeah, so I, I find it fascinating when you taste the whole range because there's so many um what you'd call almost delicate flavors they're really kind of really kind of light touches but then there's some really punchy flavors, aren't there? It's it's a really big contrast when you're you're tasting through it. You're like, oh wow, like you can really taste that. And then you're like, oh crikey, there's there's something big going on here. Like the amber, you've got so many punchy flavors. So it's 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 absolutely a lovely contrast that you get when you're tasting through it. 
I think something to bear in mind, which is an interesting way when you're actually evaluating um, gins generally when you're testing them, is to look for the experience in, in your mouth. And Bo, you know, referenced the way that if you look at all, all three of my gins, all of the ones that we make, that it has a very high viscosity to it already. Mm. And that translates into a beautiful mouth feel. It's because of the way we make it. I mentioned earlier that we use a one-shot method which means that unlike most gins, commercially made gins, um, where you make a concentrate and then it is stretched by adding pure um, alcohol to the concentrate mm -hmm. and only does it um, water down to the required strength. I don't do any of that. It comes out of the out of Meg, which by the way is the name of my pot store. So when, it's, when Meg has delivered a delicious you know, um, potion at the other end, all we do is we immerse the additional botanicals, you know, for the required number of days and so on to get the, the extra um, top notes and extracting the color as well. And then we just dilute it with the required, um, you know, water strength. So you get more of the oils, mm -hmm. you get a higher concentration of the aromatics that leads the experience because with all of the, the taste and, you know, the, that kind of let's unlock the memories that make something memorable starts with the nose. So that's part of why you experience it in the way you do as well. It's the way we make it. Yeah, I, I think that um, that piece around the the whole intensity of flavor when you're you're doing that method rather than the uh, you know ma making a concentrate and then just watering it down with alcohol. It's probably not understood quite enough by the drinking public because it does make a huge difference, doesn't it? I mean, you can just see it, you can smell it, you can taste it. You're like, wow, the intensity and the freshness of the flavors which you're getting when you're not going through the other method really, really does count, really does count. Um, we've spoken quite a bit about the kind of, I suppose, the method, the the um, the, the botanicals which are going into it, etc. But also that. A big part of your story, and again, this is about the many layers of of, of the Inverosh brand and what you're all about, is the fact that you know there aren't a lot of um, distilleries out there which have been founded and um, pioneered by females, and also your eth ethos and um, ethics when it comes to how you interact with the local community and uh, that sort of things, you know, that that's a unique story in its own. Can you talk us through a little bit about uh, your, the reaction to what you, what happened when you started out, both yeah. maybe from your peers in, in the wider international uh, distilling community, but, you know, locally, maybe in South Africa. Um, yes. I mean, for, for, just going back to when I started, that I just was a bunch of, you know, women that basically I was starting out um, and the people that I surrounded myself with just happened to be women. And then once I started to expand into having to employ people to help me with the process, mm -hmm. I just found that women were genuinely just more dependable, um, reliable and careful with the type of processes that um, I was making. And, you know, men are great, but women are just better in this sense. I'm sorry to have to say this. And you, as you, that, my wife would agree with everything you're saying. So, uh. <laughs> and so you know, it's, and, and you'll see from the packaging and everything, you know, you just need to look at my bottles and my packaging that it, it's, <laughs> it's like perfume. So yeah, absolutely. Right the go, you know, the, the whole idea of um, like a, a Chanel approach that it's delicate and it's feminine in the way we present it and the, and the involvement of women in my business continues. Uh, you know, 70% of the women or of the employees that work for in Roche are all women and they're mm. all 10 heads of households and, um, and in South Africa and in Africa generally. That is a really a critical component um, of the economy and you know the socioeconomic benefits of of being closely connected to the community is immeasurable. I mean, I as, as 
um, you, you know, Phil, but not everybody else. I started out as a, a politician in South Africa when I came back from Scotland, back home. Um, and so the, the experience of being involved in politics and understanding the challenges of unemployment and in particular the, the plight of women in the society in Africa was mm. most definitely one of the reasons why um, I think the kind of business that we ended up with is um, I hope I hope will be a, a, a model for many yeah. other businesses to translate whatever you do not only to be sustainable in the environmental sense but also to make sure that that um, circle is continued through you know with the local community. Yeah, I, I I completely agree with all of that, and it's if if every company in the world had similar ethics, then we'd be in a very different place to where we are. Which is uh, <laughs> it's great to you know that is, that's that's uh, um, without being too political, even though you're an ex politician, you know that's that's. Um, I learned my lesson. That's why I make Responsible gin. capitalism, I, make I think. Yeah. <laughs> Lessons learned. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, um, I've got another question here, um, which is going into the kind of bigger picture about your um, uh, your development as a, as a brand. Uh, it says uh, being South Africa's largest artisanal gin producer uh, and global reach as it stands, alongside Pernod Ricard's investment. Where is Inverosh going next? With obviously you've burst onto the um, international stage with getting some backing from Pony Ricard, who are a fantastic global um, player. Um, where do you want to go is, is the... Uh, is the question. Oh, obviously, okay. obviously, UK is, is, is covered off. Yeah. <laughs> there we are. That's kind of answers is we, that's where we're going. We, we are going to, you know, take over the world to make sure that everybody understands the significance of, you know, that origin story. That is why I set out. But Perno Ricard has really given me the, you know, the, the investment from Perno and the, the partnership with, with this, you know, family owned business that is global um, makes it possible for me to accelerate, you know, my, my global reach and the expansion. And um, I think Travis touched on it when he was telling, you know, about his journey with Mirage that, you know, a year ago, almost um, next month, we were in, in New York. Um, where we, um, was in, we were invited by Charlize Theron and it was kind of the launch um, into the American market at that point. And of course, then COVID happened. Um, so, you know, mm. we have to now, you know, do some catch up. But the, the vision for me is twofold. I think it is first of all to be able to take the business model that we are forging which will be 100% African and 100% local and zero carbon footprint within five years. We started that process about six, seven months ago. And to roll that out throughout the, um, throughout our, our um, throughout Perno Ricard. So we, we are the poster child. They have adopted us, you know, globally to lead the way to be able to do business within our industry in this way. And the second part of it is to be able to find those opportunities to, like we're doing tonight, to, to share, you know, not only the, this liquid and the experience to, you know, really taste history, but also to be able to find something there that resonates with every person that has an opportunity to not only listen to me, but just share. A bottle of, of gin so that we can you know hopefully to start to change the world so my vision is to save the planet with gin i think that's uh, the way i'd like to put it <laughs> your, your your comments are being echoed in the in the chat um uh, these people are saying less politics more gin if there was more <laughs> gin in politics things would be better I I, I I i think i think that's probably a very very good um good thing to to 
to go down. I think uh, if, if there are more distillers in politics, I think things would be a lot better. Um, Lorna, at the moment, uh, we've got to announce uh, the fact that we've got a winner on our uh, competition. So um, we, the, the, the word, the phrase rather, which uh, was the winning phrase was sour figs. So I think if Charlie can um, spotlight, there we go. There you go. <laughs> now, well done. <laughs> now, if you if you can, uh, well done for winning. If you can um, send me a uh, an email with your details, then we'll get a, a, a bottle in the post to you. All right. So, well, well, well done. You are in, in the UK, are you? I am. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, okay, all right. Yeah. If you're in South Africa, maybe we need to go <laughs> do some other logistics on that one. But well done for spotting that. So thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Um, OK, well, Lorna, I don't want to keep you up too long. I know that it's um, it's it's pretty much midnight now. Um, I've got one other question. I think I was going to. Uh, oh yeah, just just in general, uh, someone was asking about um, how are things in South Africa with the um, you know the alcohol bans and lockdowns and stuff. Are, you, you're you're obviously surviving, but. Um, is is that is the situation improving? We hope it is. Um, yes, it was touch and go there for a while. I mean, um, in in our industry, um, the knock on effect, the upstream downstream effect, not only directly with you know with ourselves and from a production point of view, everything stopped. You know, they stopped mm. production, they stopped you know the export everything for uh, we lost so much money and such a lot of and impetus as i meant uh, you know the 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 whole process of having started for example in america came to a grinding halt and we missed summer you know we missed as you know we were all planning to launch earlier in the yeah, uk absolutely you know so it's been very difficult for us, but we've been fortunate enough to be able to weather the storm because, you know, I believe it has a lot to do with the fact that um, we have a really loyal base in South Africa. And the minute that, you know, the doors opened, people made sure they stocked up because we all got caught short a little bit, you know, with not having stocked up on, you know, the, the important <laughs> bits for the for the pantry. And we've managed to, you know, claw back what, what was lost. But there's been on this permanent damage being done, particularly with the on consumption. And, and bartenders, um, you know, have just gone out of business. Um, mm. A lot of the restaurant industry is just, you know, decimated and will never recover. And mm. interestingly enough, you mentioned earlier, you asked the question about female as led in the industry. It's a really interesting fact that very few people realize that in, in South Africa, for example, all of the, the taverns, more than I think it's 40, 48% of tavern owners throughout the, the local townships, et cetera, are women. Mm. Uh, and the, if you understand the context that I um, illustrated earlier on about how most women are you know not only matriarchs to care for the family but are the main breadwinners and are kind of the anchors and family what an impact that has had not only in our industry but as i say people who do the bottles who do the corks who you know do the packaging so it's it's, it's had all of that but we we get we're optimistic that it will you know get better yeah i, I really hope so and the same thing seems to be happening throughout the world in various different ways um uh, and, but fortunately you know in the uk we've managed to keep our heads above water with you know great online partners like spirits kiosk and on that note uh, for anybody who's um who's hasn't had a bottle yet who hasn't ordered a bottle you need to get online um go either go to our um sipping rooms page and there'll be a link in there to the spirits kiosk and there's a 10% discount uh, for a period of time. So do, if you've not tasted it, which I'm sure a lot of you have, but um, get, get on and um, 
Uh, I think, yeah, Emil's just shared the link in, in the chat. So, so get on there. There's a discount. Um, and if, you, if, if, if you're running low, I'm sure it's a good time to top, top, top up. What has been amazing, Lorna, has been the response since we since we launched the brand um yeah got got the got the stock into the country you know the the, the interest in in Varoche has been fantastic you know um uh, there's a lot of love from the south african community obviously but i think in general people um are really fascinated by the story and it's it's um yeah, I think I think this time next year um, we'll be looking back and thinking we've done a really fantastic first year. Um, hopefully, got it into a whole load of places, lots of nice bars, stocking it. Hopefully, when the, the on trades back. But uh, yeah, it's it's been it's been a really encouraging start in the middle of a pandemic. You know that that people are wanting to try new stuff and um, recognizing when of great brands hit hit the shores in 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 the UK um I'm just looking to see if there are any other questions um I I know Lorna it's really um is is Charlie's asking me is is Travis still on 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 online Travis are you still there I don't know um uh, oh, oh Tra travis travis charlie charlie's asking if if you can flare for, for to finish off the night flare flare <laughs> you're gonna knock out that you're gonna make a dent in that light if you do that uh, that that light shade i can see I can see something going terribly wrong flare, going, does, he, does he want you to flare yeah he wants you to flare yeah Okay, just give me two seconds here. Two seconds. I, and and I, I can see some other questions coming in, asking where my where my dog and cat are. I'm gonna I'm gonna find one of them. I'm not gonna flare with them, but I'm gonna find them. One second. I'm back. Tell Charlie that if I drop this now. And I wake up my kids for the whole night that he's got to come here and sort of the situation. <laughs> okay, can you see me? Yes, we can see you. Yeah. We talk about being put on the spot a little bit here. Yeah? <laughs> That that's liquor, as you say, oh, right? Cool. <laughs> wow, Taris, is is liquor the right word to use? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, liquor. And good timing. Well done, Phil. Yeah, I've got, I've got my cat. Here we go. He, he's <laughs> famous. He's famous here. He's he's off. Yeah. Thanks for that. That's that's great. Um. Um, okay, guys. Well, I'm I'm definitely going to say thank a big thank you to <laughs> Travis. I think we'll be signing off quite soon. Lorna, I don't want to keep you up any any longer. We've been through loads of questions. Okay. I think we've covered off all the questions which came in, um, and plus I I think I threw, threw threw in a few as well as well. But um, thank you so much for this evening. It was really good to talk to you. Um, I hope you enjoyed yourself. I have. Thank you very much for having me. Good, good, good. And um, hopefully it won't be too long before you can come up and um, see us in the UK. And we can take you around some new accounts and hopefully the on-trade will be open by then and we can yeah, show you all the good stuff. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you, guys. Not, not at all. See you soon. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. bye.
Okay, guys. Um, let's, uh, if usually at this point, people want to talk to each other. So um, I'm absolutely happy if um, we unmute people. I don't know who's still on. Loads of people still on. Um, okay. I think I, I think I've been, uh, I'm co-host, so I can actually start unmuting people. Let me try it. Let me try it. I've got a question for Bo. Did we, did we miss anything from the story which she wants to add to it? Bo, are you hearing? Cool. Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I think Lorna pretty much covered it, but I know that she is uh, very, very passionate about excuse me, about the, uh, the cradle of creativity. Um, and that was the two archaeological points that she was sort of speaking about um, and how all these archaeological facts have been discovered over the years. Um, Could you hold then, your mic a bit closer, Bo? Sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. So I was just saying the um, cradle of creativity, as they dub it, which are the two archaeological points that Lorna speaks of, which are the Blombos Cave and Pinnacle Points, and how all these discoveries have essentially shown that um, us as modern creative thinkers all originated within that same sort of area, and that is our common origin. Um, and I think if Lorna had enough time, she would go through each and every one of those artifacts and go through all of the stories. Um, but I think all in all, she sort of covered mm -hmm. the majority of it. Yeah, it was it was um, pretty fascinating mm -hmm. what she was saying about stuff. And uh, yes, yeah, I, I said it's the first gin tasting when we when we did our staff immersion in back in in February. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't believe that she started showing us like architecture um archaeological uh, <laughs> artifacts or something yes. wow <laughs> it's, it's um, absolutely what's crazy really cool is just to um let people know out there we have recently just done a virtual distillery tour which is up and live on our website so if you go to embrash.ca you can actually go through to the virtual distillery tour and for people uh, that are not in the country and not able to have access to our wonderful distillery you can literally do it virtually um, and you can go sit and have a tasting with Lorna and go through each one of the liquids individually. You can go see a magnanimous snake, which is our pot still and how it distills the gin. And it's just a really cool thing to see um, all the little details of um, this amazing distillery that Lorna created. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't recommend that highly enough. It, it looks absolutely amazing, that, that, that virtual tour. Yeah, really, really, really good. So guys, um, you can uh, anybody can unmute themselves um, if you want to have a chat. I know the the usually people who want to have a chat between themselves um, or with me occasionally ask me why I'm wearing the same shirt as I was last time. Um, and please do. Um, be great to great to see some familiar faces. So um, more than happy to um, yeah have a chat with people. I, I will even go and get try and get Hazel the dog. Give me two seconds. Hey guys, how are you doing? How's it in East London? Cool. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. How did the cocktail go down? Was it good, Nico? I should finish. Nico has been sipping number all night. Look at this. He's been all over it. <laughs> all uh. 
It's not finished. He drank his own neat. Yeah. It's a disgrace. Stop it, guys. All right, here's Hazel to say hello to everybody. She's uh, looking very proud of herself. Hi, Hazel. Look. Hey, Nicole. Hi, Hazel. <laughs> How does she like the baby, Phil? She absolutely loves it. They, they, they have such a funny relationship. He, whenever he sees her, he starts laughing and then I like, tries to reach his, reaches out to her and stuff. They, they absolutely love each other. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, they're very funny. And he's fascinated with Arthur as well. He just oh. stares and giggles at him. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Who drinks more gin, Aza or Barity? Um, well, <sighs> Um, Bertie has shown some early signs of wanting to grab any drink which I'm drinking. So um, whether it's champagne or, or gin and tonic or whatever, he's just like tries to reach out and grab it. So I don't think the apple falls too far from the tree with that boy. <laughs> uh, it's, um, he's really funny. Uh, we, we we think he'll be on to steaks and oyster or something before too long. You know, he's he's absolutely fascinated with any kind of food which we're we're eating. He's like, what what's that going on? So, uh, he's only four months. He's he's wanting food, definitely wanting solids. Mm -hmm. definitely. Wow. Yeah. Travis, thanks yeah. for doing the flaring, my friend. No good, it's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> no one. Travis was a superstar. Yeah, ne we needed some uh, little bit of light entertainment to finish off, I think. Yeah. You know, Tra all good, man. All good. Tra Travis, you're moving to Portugal. When, when is yeah. that happening? On the 10th, 10th of December. Crikey. And is, is that a permanent move? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Permanent move. Crikey. Well, we've, we'll have to come down and see you. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, uh, we're going to be in um, Lisbon, so yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Lisbon Bar Show, got to come, got to come. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, I've had, um, my my stag do got cancelled. It was supposed to be in Lisbon, uh, and then another friend's stag do got cancelled because it was supposed to be in Li Lisbon because of lockdown. So yeah, it's a it's it's a black mark against Lisbon. I tried to go twice yeah. and managed to make it. Yeah. What they say, third time lucky, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe it's maybe it's just not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I think they um, just went out of lockdown two nights ago or something like that. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been pretty strict over there. Yeah, yeah. That'll be good. Have we still got Alex online? Alex. <sighs> I thought he was. See, bring the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. So how uh, did everyone enjoy that? Um, a little bit different. Sorry, we couldn't we couldn't get to the um, distillery in Still Bay this time. It just the the internet connection over there um, was just couldn't support the the tour or anything like that. So we had to do it. From lots of different places so i hope that was still everyone still got a good experience nevertheless yeah yeah i think they, it was great to speak to lorna for such a long time think, yeah. Lorna's amazing. she's super inspirational only time i get to spend around her i i take it but we were in new york for a week or so, something like that. And just spend some time chatting to her. I mean, she's just obviously so passionate about her brands and you know about philanthropy and she's just a very, very cool, cool person. I'll choose for that. <laughs> yeah, it's just if you if you think back and think, okay, this person they started out and you know only what nine years ago. They're not come from a distilling background and they've come up with a 
product like that it's just like <laughs> it's, it's incredible i think it's also i mean if you look at brands today a lot of these brands have been around for years and years and years and to have a brand like embrace that has been around for nine years and has gotten to where it has today i think mm-hmm. it's just phenomenal i mean we're competing with international gyms out there um <laughs> you know so yeah it's yeah. a brand that i'm super passionate about and and very very proud to be working for too yeah and I don't think anything's confected about it. You know, it's like, as I said to her, you know, there's a lot of people be like, oh, okay, well, you know, my inspiration was this and this. Actually, yeah. she's thought about absolutely everything. 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 Really last detail. <laughs> and it comes out. Really down, last detail. It goes, it goes back to the tasting in my mind, mm-hmm. because the tasting is when you set yourself up for what a brand is all about. And the tasting yeah. is so in, you know it's like so precise Mm -hmm. you're like okay well this brand actually has had everything thought out about it um yeah which is 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 fantastic i love that kind of precision about no this is the way you've got to drink it (laughs) this is it okay you can do something else after you if you if you want but this is the way it's meant to be you know Um, and to think it's also come out of a little town like Sobai, where there's literally a population of 6,000 people, and there's absolutely nothing that goes on there except for December time when everyone goes there on holiday. I mean, they've got one petrol station in the entire town, and yet there's this amazing gin that's being produced from this very town. Um, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I can't wait to go down and see us at some point. I've never been to South Africa. But uh, it's a beautiful country. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it will, we'll get down there before too long. Yeah. Mm, hopefully. I know that Charlie's wanted to go. Mm-hmm. Keeps on dropping hints, don't you, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, I'm gonna push on now. Charis, buddy. Happy me, guys. And we'll see you really soon. If yeah, you've got to come down to South Africa. Yeah, most definitely. Place in the world, man. Yeah. And well, well, we'll come down and see you in Portugal. And, and, and you'll come to London. Um, yeah, we'll go for a nice bar too. Yeah, well, sounds amazing. Uh, Travis, come in summertime in, in London. It's not, it's, we'll, we'll show you a different side of London. You know, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not I've been in, mu- in summer. No, it's great. It's great in summer. Yeah. Yeah, it's good fun. Yeah. Apart from the sweaty tubes. Okay. See you later. Thanks, guys. See you later. Ciao. Bye. 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 Guys, I think I'm also gonna kick it. It's heading on to Hoppers Paul there. <laughs> um, and I've got a full Bo, day of work Thank you so well. much. Cheers, guys. Thank you so See much. This was an honor bye doing bye. this, and hopefully we'll chat soon. Chat soon. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Cheers, bye. Ciao, Bo. Uh, I have to go too, otherwise tomorrow Charlie's going to be upset with me because I'm too sleepy. Uh, yeah. My yeah. boss is online, so I need to behave. It's better if I go to bed. <laughs> Ciao, Nico. Cheers, guys. Cheers, guys. Bye. Ciao. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Okay, guys. Well, if, um, if no one's going to be chatting, I've got... Um, I've got a four-month-old uh, who needs to be put down to bed. And um, Charlie, I'll, I'll leave it up to you, but I, th- I think we could call it a day now. I think we can call it a day. Thank you, everyone, yeah, for joining. Yeah. Um, we'll see you next time on uh, on the 16th of December okay. for the rum tasting with Market Row Rum. And hopefully you guys can join us for that. Yeah, that's going to be a good pre-Christmas one. London-based rum. It's going to be really fun. Yeah, that's our next one in a three three weeks' time. So, yeah. Yeah, see everybody then. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining. See you later. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.